On this week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast, always sharpen the saw. Welcome to the Crushing Debt Podcast with your host, Florida attorney Sean Yesner, where our goal is to help you get rid of the financial bullies in your life. So welcome back to this week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast. My name is Sean Yesner, owner and founder of Yesner Law. And I have an episode for you this week that I've done uh, in previous years, so this will be an updated episode. Before I get there real quick, I do want to say thank you to our sponsor, Sam Cohen of Attorneys First Insurance. Uh, You know, I get advertisements from other malpractice companies uh, quite regularly as an attorney, and even though Sam is always very kind and generous and says, yeah, shop us, shop us around, you know, call these other companies and see what they have to offer. I, I really don't ever do so because I know that uh, Sam is going to be able to meet or beat uh, anything that any of these other companies are going to do. Plus, I know that I can always just pick up the phone and call Sam if I have a question about malpractice coverage or E&O coverage versus one of these uh, blind solicitations you know, I may never see or hear from that salesperson again if I went with that other company. So uh, Sam does malpractice insurance, errors and omissions insurance for attorneys and title companies all over the country. I know that he has a focus right now on Florida and Texas. So a great way to support me, a great way to support the show, a great way to say thank you to Sam is to refer an attorney or title company to him that you know may be coming due Uh, for their malpractice renewal, their professional liability insurance renewal. You can reach him at sam at attorneysfirst.com or www.attorneysfirst.com. But what I wanted to talk about this week, always sharpen the saw. So those of you that have been longtime listeners know that I annually set a goal for the number of books that I want to read in a given year. And and actually, interestingly, this is the first year I didn't do that because reading has become such a habit and so ingrained that I kind of felt like setting a goal for the number of books that I want to read was really not a good goal anymore because now reading is just simply a habit. I read for about a half hour uh, every morning, half hour to 45 minutes every morning. Uh, The house is quiet. I'm the first one up. I get my cup of coffee, uh, check my blood sugar, take uh, my morning uh, pills, uh, grab my cup of coffee, and then sit and read for 30 to 45 minutes. And and I'm able to knock out, I mean, as I'm recording this in early January, I'm almost finished with my third book, uh, of the year. And and again, when I say read a book, I mean read a book. I mean physically hold it, flip pages. Now maybe I've I've read it on my my Kindle or my iPad uh, through the Kindle app or something like that, but I'm physically holding it. I'm not listening to the book on any kind of audio program. Not to say there's anything wrong with that. I was a little bit critical of that in previous uh, years episodes. Not to say there's anything wrong with listening as long as you're taking in the content. I think that's what's important. And the title of this week's episode Sharpen the Saw sort of relates to that. In other words, you know, what are we doing on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis to stay focused, to get better, to uh, learn new tips and tricks and skills uh, to do things to improve not only for our business but for our family, for our life, and I'll get into a lot of that here as I go through. So I did want to go through some of the books that I read uh, in uh, last year, in uh, 2021. Now I'm not going to go through all of them. Now for those of you that are wondering what the number was, uh, in 2020 I ended up knocking down 52 books, basically one book uh, a week. My goal was 50 Uh, I had miscounted, and I ended up doing 52, so I I exceeded my goal in 2020, maybe because I was sitting here a lot during COVID with almost nothing to do other than to read, Uh, whether I'm reading here in the morning, or I took the book outside, or I, you know, went went somewhere to to get some sun, or whatever. Uh, So I read a ton of books uh, in 2020. I did not repeat that in 2021. I did have a goal of, I think, 30 books. Uh, and I ended up reading 26, so exactly half of what I did the year before, basically one book every two weeks instead of one book uh, every week. And so I'm not going to go through all 26. If you want to know uh, all 26 uh, that I read, go ahead and contact me, uh, Sean at yesnerlaw.com, shoot me an email, connect with me on social media, whatever, and I'll give you the list of, of all uh, 20 books, uh, I'm sorry, 26 books that I read. Uh, I'm not going to do that on this episode. 
And if you have suggestions for some great books that you have read, definitely send them over. I've got a stack of books uh, that that are lined up here. As I finish one, I start the next one. Uh, But I'm always looking for suggestions. I'm always looking for uh, new things that I can read. Now, these books are on a variety of topics, and I'll go into each one of those, and I'll probably take them in order here. Uh, but uh, let me let me start with the first book. So the first book is called You Can Negotiate Anything. Uh, and again, as an attorney, one of the skills that I think I bring to the table is my ability to negotiate. Now, sometimes I do a really good job of negotiating, and sometimes I don't do a good job at all of negotiating. But this book uh, had an impact on me because it was literally about how to uh, negotiate. And it did talk a lot about the, the things you would think of in terms of negotiation. You know, think about win-win. Think about what the other side wants. What do they want to accomplish? What are their what are their pain points? Are you listening to them? Are you really listening to what they want and then trying to craft a solution uh, that gets them there? So that was that was a really great book. You can negotiate anything. And again, if you're not uh, writing these down, I'll, I'll put the links or I'll put the titles of the books here that I'm going over uh, in the notes so you can reference back to those later in case you don't pick up on any of them. Uh, the next one, the second book, was called Shark in the Housing Pool. Now, this one was more related to the foreclosure defense and real estate stuff that I do. And it was the true story uh, of a guy who was convicted of basically mortgage fraud and, and in essence, how he did it, how he uh, faked loans, how he faked satisfactions of loans, how he would go to multiple banks to refinance the same property and time the closings such that one bank didn't know about the other. And so he would make millions and millions and millions of dollars using fake identities on different properties and and ended up he ended up getting caught and he ended up serving jail time. And while he was in jail, he started writing. And this is one of the books that he wrote about uh, how he did it, how he got caught. Uh, I did try to get him uh, as a guest here on the show. Uh, it didn't work out. So maybe I'll, I'll see if I can reach back out here in 2022 and get him as a guest on the show. But it was a really, really interesting book. Um, not so much a how-to because he did end up getting caught in the end, and I think a lot of the loopholes that he exploited have been closed for the most part by the bank and, and by the banks and by the banking system. And, you know, it also is a lesson in if some people took these talents to think creatively in how to help uh, instead of commit crimes, you know, where would we be uh, as a society? Again, not to criticize. He did what he did. He served his time. He was honest about uh, how, how he did what he did, uh, paid repaid his debt uh, to society, served his time, and is now uh, out and and educating other people on how to avoid these types of scams, educating banks and, and government agencies on how to avoid these types of scams. But again, Shark in the Housing Pool was uh, a great book. Uh, skipping over to the fifth one that I read, a book called Clockwork. Now, one of the things that may stand out about Clockwork is it's written by Mike Michalowicz. Mike Michalowicz was a guest on the Crushing Debt podcast for his book, Profit First, and it was a great interview. I still uh, get get good feelings when I think about that interview. Uh, it was a great, great interview. Clockwork is really about how to set up your business so that it runs like clockwork. And I think one of the things that the book sets up is taking you know a month off, taking six weeks off, taking two months off. In other words, taking time off, setting up the systems so that your business runs like clockwork, so that it makes money while you're not there, so that you can take time off. And the whole purpose of the book is geared towards, at the end, taking that two months off. Now, I didn't didn't get there, uh, but I am taking off more time here in the office. I I don't work on Fridays anymore. I do, but I work mostly uh, from home. And once I knock out what I need to do uh, Friday, which is typically by 11 or 12, uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, 12 noon, typically by the time I, I knock out the tasks I need to knock out, I take the rest of the day off. And Friday, Saturday, Sunday then belongs to me. Uh, and my family and a lot of the things that I implemented and a lot of the things that that set up that ability to take Friday off came from reading that book Clockwork. So anytime you get the opportunity to pick up a Mike Michalowicz book, I would definitely, definitely suggest uh, that you do it. The next book that I read is a book called The Great Depression or The New Great Depression. And this was, in my mind, a fantastic book uh, about 
the economy, about the way that money works, uh, about different things going on in the economy. It was written recently, and it does take COVID into consideration and talks about the impact uh, that the pandemic has on the economy. And, and it's got some predictions. I've probably got to go back and look and see which of those predictions have come true and which ones have sort of fallen uh, to the wayside. But The New Great Depression was a, a an eye-opening book in terms of the way that money works. And so if you're interested in learning more about how money works and how the economy works and how all these different markets work and, and interact and and play together. Uh, The New Great Depression is a great, great, great book. Uh, Skipping over to the ninth book I read this year, Why My J-O-B Quit Me, Why My Job Quit Me. Now that was by uh, Michelle Kapaska, who's a real estate investor locally here in the Tampa Bay area. She wrote her first book. She is a friend. She is a client. She is a fellow uh, content creator. She was a guest on the show for the book. Uh, It was a fantastic book and basically tells the stories that Michelle learned to uh, help people in the way that she does her real estate investing, problem solving, thinking creatively, thinking outside the box, thinking win-win, taking from some of the negotiation skills uh, that we talked about. And and it was a really quick read. It's a fantastic book. Why My J-O-B Quit Me? Uh, if you have questions, a great little uh, how-to book on on mindset and and how to think positively and how to think uh, in a way that's solution oriented rather than just focusing on the problem and and whining about the problem. Great, great, great book. Uh, the next one I want to talk about, the twelfth book here, is called Remarkable Business. Now, the reason I'm bringing this book up is because it was a solicitation to me. Uh, to, to from somebody who uh, writes compilation style books. And the pitch that he gave me was, you know, you'll be a published author. Now, he didn't realize that I already am a twice published author uh, with both the Crushing Debt book and the Become Debt Free book. But I thought, you know, what the heck, let me see what we can do with a compilation style book. And so I was interviewed and that was transcribed, and I got to read the, the transcription of the chapter, and then that was put into the book along with all the other uh, business owners that he had interviewed for the book, and it, and it came out as a compilation-style book. Again, fairly short read, I think anywhere from 100 to 150 pages. My chapter, I think, is probably about 10 to 12 pages long, not very big. Um, but again, now I am a three-time published author, uh, having a chapter in this uh, remarkable business book, and actually four-time published author if you think about some of the legal education stuff uh, that I've published. But remarkable business, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I didn't follow through on any of the other opportunities that this particular compilation author uh, sent my way because, uh, you know, I've already written two or three books, and for me, uh, I, it did what I needed it to do, which was give me some additional content that I can uh, give away to all of you. I do have about four, five, six copies of the book still with me. So if any of you are interested in getting a copy of it for free, you can definitely email me again, Sean at yesnerlaw.com, uh, and I can send you a copy of the book. Now, the way the book is set up is that if you pay for and buy the book, a portion of those proceeds go. Uh, to a a charity, to support a charity. So if you want to do it that way, you are certainly welcome to do so. Uh, But again, I do have some free copies uh, that I can can give away. So let me know there. Now the next two are books that I just thought were fantastic books. Uh, One is called Your Best Year Yet. And I read this probably about mid-year, so uh, probably should have read it closer to the beginning or the end of the year. Uh, But the whole concept of the book is how to uh, plan out your year, how to put the systems in place, uh, how to how to set goals, how to do the things that you need to do so that you have your best year yet. And and again, a lot of these books, you know, people may say, well, you just read them and throw them on the bookshelf. No, I do actually take stuff away from all these books. When I read, uh, I have another journal that I keep next to me. And uh, when I get to something, I don't like writing in the books. I don't like uh, highlighting in the books. I don't like, I don't even like breaking the spine of the books. So when I read them, I'm very careful not to do any damage uh, to the books. 
Uh, but what I do is when a point resonates with me, I have this journal and I write it down. And then uh, this journal that I have now goes all the way back, gosh, I think to like 2012 or 13 or something like that. And a couple of times a year, I like to go back to the beginning of the journal and just flip through it and different things that I've gleaned from different books, different articles that I've put in there, different uh, sayings, different different um, motivational sayings, different uh, things that I've cut out of magazines, clipped from magazines, and, and all that kind of stuff. And so I go back to that journal uh, a couple of times a year, three, four, five times a year, and I, and I flip through everything, plus I write in it as I read these books. And so that's how I absorb the information, is if I have something that resonates with me, I have this journal that I write down that I can then refer back to at a later time. But Your Best Year Yet, fantastic book, uh, I highly, highly recommend it, especially if you want to have your best year yet. Then I also read The Energy Bus. The Energy Bus is a parable, meaning it's told in the nature of a story. Uh, and it's a story of a guy who is just down on his luck. Anything bad that could have happened to him that day happened to him that day. He wasn't having a good day at work. Uh, his car broke down. He wasn't making a lot of money. He was having problems uh, in his marriage. He was having problems in his relationship with his kids. And because he had to take his car into the shop to get repaired, he had to ride this bus uh, to work, uh, to and from work every day. And so the, the energy bus is literally the story of riding on this particular bus. And the bus driver uh, is, a, is a particularly interesting character that provides lessons on how to increase your energy, increase your positivity, increase your better your relationships with your staff, with your boss, with your family, with your kids. Uh, and again, a great, uplifting, motivational book, a, a short read. Uh, but again, The Energy Bus, uh, one of my favorite books uh, from last year. Just great, great, great book. The next one I want to talk about is Bitcoin Billionaires. Now, again, those of you that have been following at least for the last year know that around the midpoint of last year, uh, I went to a Bitcoin blockchain conference over in Orlando. Now, uh, as I record this, we are already gearing up for PodFest 2022, which again is going to be live in Orlando. And uh, as part of that conference, we are also going to have the Bitcoin and blockchain conference going on at that same time. If you want details, you can go to podfestexpo.com. Uh, I think PodFest is at the end of May 2022. So if you're listening to this before the end of May 2022, there's probably still time to pick up a PodFest ticket. And the Bitcoin blockchain conference is right around that same time. I think the Bitcoin blockchain conference precedes PodFest. So if you're interested in going, uh, you can also search. I don't know the website off the top of my head. I may try to find it and put it in the show notes. But if you just search Florida Bitcoin and Blockchain Conference, uh, you should be able to find it uh, on Google to get your tickets. I do believe the tickets are separate. So I do believe that a ticket to PodFest does not get you into the Bitcoin Blockchain Conference and vice versa. Uh, but if you're interested in learning more about Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrency and all that stuff, uh, the Bitcoin Blockchain Conference was a fantastic uh, event to attend. Now, one of the things that I learned from that event was uh, the different books to read to educate yourself on uh, Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrency. And one of the ones that was widely recommended was Bitcoin Billionaires. Now, Bitcoin Billionaires is the story of the Winklevoss twins. Those of you that remember, they were also involved in uh, Facebook, in the early days of Facebook, uh, until uh, Zuckerberg. Uh, and there's, I guess, some debate if you look at it from Zuckerberg's point of view or the twins' point of view, you know, who did who to what. So I won't necessarily get into any of that. But basically how the twins took their Facebook buyout and invested it into cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and literally became the first billionaires created by Bitcoin. Uh, and so it's a fantastic story of how, uh, true story, mostly true story, I would assume, there may be some explanation, some embellishment of some of the facts, but uh, I think it's a fairly true story of how these twins became the first Bitcoin billionaires. It's a story of how Bitcoin and blockchain works. It explains uh, Satoshis, it explains uh, wallets, hot wallets, cold wallets. It explains all those different things uh, that surround Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrency. So if you're interested 
in Bitcoin or blockchain. If you invest in Bitcoin or blockchain, number one, I would suggest going to the Bitcoin blockchain conference here in May uh, in Orlando, May of 2022. And if you're listening to this beyond May of 2022, definitely search on Google. Um, you know, I've said for years, PodFest is going to continue into the future, and I think so is the Bitcoin blockchain conference. So if you're listening to this episode after May of 2022, definitely search Google for these events. I have a feeling they will still uh, be going on uh, even years and years beyond this podcast episode. But if you're interested in Bitcoin blockchain cryptocurrency, again, definitely pick up Bitcoin billionaires. Uh, the next book was The Bomber Mafia. That was written by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell is one of my favorite authors, and The Bomber Mafia was slightly different from a lot of the other books that he's written, and, and that's what sort of drew me to it. And it's the story of basically the, the way the bomber um, units, the bomber squadrons developed uh, back in, I think, World War II. Um, and and it's, it's a great uh, true story about how all of that uh, came to be and was created. So, again, it's it's not a business book like uh, a lot of Malcolm Gladwell's other books. It's not necessarily a novel either, uh, sort of in between the two, but, but a great, great read uh, nonetheless. Uh, the next book is The Pumpkin Plan, again, by our friend Mike Michalowicz. So, uh, if you think about clockwork, you think about The Pumpkin Plan, uh, Mike Michalowicz has written a ton of of business-related books, and anytime I get the opportunity to read one, I always take advantage of it, whether it be Profit First or The Pumpkin Plan or or whatever. Um, and and again, great, great book. Anytime you get the opportunity to read a Mike Michalowicz book, um, do it. Do it. Uh, definitely don't pass up that opportunity. Then I started to get into some storytelling and some branding books, and, and some of those continued. And when I do next year's episode, you'll hear about some of those books that I've already read. But uh, the next one was Building a Story Brand, and it was a great book on how to craft your message to build your brand. Uh, and it had some great tips. It had some great content. It had some great um, things in it in terms of how to create your story how to create your brand. So again, building a story brand, great book. We're sort of getting towards the end. Uh, The next one I read was The 401k Revival. Now this one was by our friend Michael Watkins. Again, his first book. Uh, And so we wanted to support him uh, in his first book. And it's called The 401k Revival. I did interview uh, Mike uh, on that book uh, here in the podcast so I can again maybe link that episode or if you just search uh, the podcast for Mike Watkins, Michael Watkins, you'll find that. But the 401k revival was a great little book on uh, how to how to manage, how to maintain your 401k, talked about the responsibility of employees, of employers that offer 401ks, uh, a, a great how-to book on what to look for in 401ks, how to invest in 401ks, pitfalls to look out for, pitfalls to watch out for. Again, the 401k revival by our friend Michael Watkins. The next one was another book that I got from the Bitcoin blockchain conference. And I think this book really sort of slowed me down. It was a thick book. I want to say it was five or 600 pages long. It was a, it was a really thick book. And so it took me some time to to take it down. But again, it was another one of those books mentioned at the Bitcoin blockchain conference that is one of those foundational books uh, if you're interested in investing in crypto. And the book is called The Creature from Jekyll Island. Now, if you are into conspiracy theories, you will love this book. If you don't like conspiracy theories, it may not be your cup of tea. Uh, so what I would recommend is that if you do read it, read it with a grain of salt. You know, anytime I read a book, I take those portions of it that I think would benefit me, those portions that I don't think would benefit me, I still read with an open mind, but I may or may not take certain portions of, the, of that book with me. The Creature from Jekyll Island is basically the story of the Fed and how the Fed was created, the Federal Reserve, and how the Fed was created. Um, the, the premise of the book is that it was created by a group of United States businessmen on Jekyll Island off of um, Georgia. And that's why it's the creature from Jekyll Island. And basically the book argues that the Fed should be eliminated. And it brings in how other foreign governments came into play here. And it brings in how different wars and different conflicts play in here. And it, and it basically makes the argument that the Fed is 
not really doing what it was designed to do, which was to be that central money system, that it's still a controlled fiat uh, money system and therefore should be eliminated. Now, I've taken six, seven hundred pages and given that to you in, what, 30, 45 seconds? So it's definitely a book that if you're interested in Bitcoin and blockchain, if you're interested in money, and if you enjoy the, the occasional conspiracy theory, uh, I would definitely suggest that you pick up The Creature from Jekyll Island. It was a long read. It was a difficult read, honestly, uh, but it was a great read. I'm, I'm glad I read it. Uh, I don't buy into all the different conspiracy theories that are in the book, but I am glad uh, that I read it and that I understand them and that I understand uh, money a little bit better for having read that book. Uh, the last two I want to get into here, uh, number 25, book number 25, the second to last book I read last year, it's called The Diabetes Code. Now, again, I've talked a lot uh, in the last couple of months about my type 2 diabetes diagnosis. And um, the good news is it is now, I think, totally under control just with uh, drugs and diet and exercise. So like I said, I wake up, I take a blood pressure pill, I take an A1C pill, uh, and I take a, a cholesterol pill. And then after I eat, I take a, a glucose disposal agent pill. Um, I do not take insulin anymore. The doctor has, has brought me off of insulin. Uh, and now I'm playing around with my diet to see how my diet impacts my blood sugar. For example, yesterday I had clam chowder, which I love clam chowder. But what I didn't realize is that there's white potatoes in clam chowder. And so when I decided to change my diet, I decided to go low glycemic, low sugar. And white potatoes are one of those things that have a high, high sugar content. So... Uh, when I woke up this morning, my sugar was a lot higher than what I wanted it to be. The doctor wants me to aim for 130 or less uh, in terms of my blood sugar. My blood sugar this morning was 151. Now, again, not a big deal. Now that I know what to do, I'm going to go running tonight uh, and I'm going to you know, stick to, to greens and vegetables and, and lean proteins and that kind of stuff. And that should bring in a lot of water and that should bring my, my blood sugar levels back down to something more in the normal range by tomorrow. But the Diabetes Code was a great book um, in terms of how to do that. Uh, it's not the only book uh, that I've read. It's not the only book that I plan to read on the topic, but it was a great book. One of the things that the book uh, taught me, one of the things the book, book recommends is uh, intermittent fasting. Now, I'm not going to do it how the book said, because the book said uh, fast every for 24 to 36 hours, 24 to 36 hours. I can't do that and still function during the day. But what I can do is not eat after dinner. And so I get about a, a 7 to 10 hour fast from the time I finish dinner until the time I wake up the next morning and eat breakfast. And the book does make a lot of sense. The Diabetes Code does make a lot of sense in terms of what causes diabetes and, and some of the different ways uh, to treat it. So uh, again, those of you that have diabetes, those of you that are worried about diabetes, those of you uh, who have family members who may have diabetes. Now, the book does talk about type 1 and type 2. I think it's more geared towards type 2. Uh, but again, the Diabetes Code was uh, a great book, a great first book for me to read in terms of how to manage and control my diagnosis, which uh, I've I've done. Uh, and, and I'm still going to follow up with doctors. I'm not done. You know, I'm not going to start shoveling down cakes and pies. Uh, I know better than that now. But um, again, The Diabetes Code was a great book. The last book I read last year is a book called Permission Marketing. Uh, and the reason I wanted to include it here, again, fairly short book, and it's by Seth Godin. And that's why I wanted to include it. I've read a lot of Seth Godin's stuff. Uh, again, one of those authors that if you have the opportunity to pick up anything that he's written, go for it, which is why I picked up permission marketing. I think the book is slightly outdated because it, it, it talks about uh, the internet um, in a little bit of a negative way in terms of the whole concept of the book is that you will make more sales if you have permission to market to your target clients versus bombarding them with um, you know, bombarding them with uh, gotcha advertisements. Uh, if you have their permission to market them, you'll make more money. Now, as a concept, it makes sense, but I think where the book sort of falls down a little bit is that I think it poo-poos the internet a little bit in terms of, you know, it, pop-up ads and, and spam and all that stuff. Definitely agree, not related at all 
to permission marketing. But I don't think the book really took into uh, account things like podcasting, things like blogging, things like things that have developed since the book was written that uh, help to create that relationship between me as the marketer and you as the as the potential target, uh, and things that have really helped me use the podcast to grow my law firm and to get more clients and to grow the business. So, um, permission marketing uh, was the last book of the year. Uh, that I that I read. I did start a book just before the year ended, but I didn't finish it until early 2022. So it'll be included in in next year's list. Again, as I recall, it was a pretty long book, which is why I didn't get it quite finished uh, in 2021. But I did uh, get through it. You'll hear about that book maybe this time next year, as I tend to do these episodes on an annual basis. But that'll do it. So what did you think? Uh, what books have you read from the list uh, that I read? What books uh, interest you? What books do you think you might want to read? What books did you read that you think I might be interested in? You know, connect with me, either Sean at Yesner Law, connect with me on Facebook, connect with me on Instagram. Uh, love getting lists of books, love getting book recommendations from different people. Um, I, I, like I said, reading has now become a habit that I'm not going to stop anytime soon. Uh, Part of the reason that I do this episode in particular is because I want you to take some ideas, not only from what I've read, but ideas of what you want to read so that you can always be sharpening the saw, so that you can always be improving yourself, and so that at the end of the month you have more money rather than at the end of the money you have more month. That'll do it for this week's episode, and I look forward to talking to you in next week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast. If you have questions that you think would make a great topic for a future episode, please email Sean or connect with us on social media. Sean Yesner and Yesner Law PL are Florida licensed attorneys. The information contained in this week's episode is not a substitute for legal advice. Your situation may differ, especially if you are located somewhere other than the state of Florida. If you have questions, please contact our office or contact a local attorney. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Crushing Debt Podcast.